Algorand. <laughs> All right. So what is Algorand is a, a distributed ledger. And the one thing we agree uh, unequivocally is that the distributed ledgers are a dream infrastructure. So the doubt starts coming when it's a, how do we implement it, right? And uh, somehow, let me contrast it with the best known type of ledger, Bitcoin, and then with a few others uh, later on. All right. So Bitcoin summary. So the idea is to have a consensus via proof of work. And the main assumption is that the only majority of money in computing power. So why are we here? Because uh, I believe that there are some technical problems that we should solve. I am very much love uh, Bitcoin idea. Head off is uh, uh, they open the road for us. But st still, there are improvements to be made. The first one, everybody knows, wastefulness of all resources that are inside, electricity, cost, fees, etc. The second one is an exogenous concentration of power, which is a little bit more uh, troublesome, right? Because of the power of a distributed ledger comes from being distributed. But if there are free mining pools that somehow control the um, um, Bitcoin uh, blockchain, how distributed it is. And, you know, and um, uh, pass and she somehow minimize the problem, but still is a problem. And um, the fact that actually miners are an exogenous power, totally different, orthogonal to money, is actually problematic. And, and so is the fact that actually they have a, a known location, because they are suck so much electricity from the network, that at least the electricity network know where they are. They actually have low margins. And you know, they have a low margin, they're few, you know where they are, they are concentrated. You know, that is a recipe for a disaster. If you want to corrupt people, that's a bit easier to know. The other one is the scalability of the system. And just a few talks ago, just we saw, in a, even the last talk, actually, uh, you know, does it scale? We need scale for this stuff to help us, right? And uh, 1 million users, 10 million, 100 million, how many can we really support? The other one is uh, forks, and forks means uh, ambiguity, right? Because some blocks may disappear, and then it's a little bit unclear uh, where uh, the, the longest blockchain is going to end up being. That is, uh, I find this problematic too. Of course, how do you defend against uh, forks? You say, well, just in case there is a fork, I'm going to consider myself paid if the block in which my payment is is three deep. Well, three deep, maybe six deep. If it is an important payment, you know, maybe 12 deep, 24. So bottom line, a block every 10 minutes now becomes you know, hours, right? And furthermore, there is something to be said about the intrinsic security of uh, any system that is really uh, based on proof of work and elongated the longest chain if the adversary has the ability of uh, partitioning the network. And therefore, you do not know I can only elongate the longest blockchain I see, but the true longest chain may be elsewhere and I don't see it. If an adversary is actually really stubborn and uh, powerful enough, can actually attack there. All right. So let me uh, very to say, is enough you know, um, uh, rooms to improve? Let's try to improve them. And uh, Algorand, uh, how, um, how does it work? It's an effortless one by one Byzantine agreement. Let me drive through it effortless and one by one. What does it mean? By the way, we don't need to agree on the genesis block. Block number one is part of the system. Everybody knows what it is. Lo and behold, B1. On the right of B1, you find a favor. I believe a universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness. And as this favor gently falls to the ground, maybe so gently, oh, so fast, where is gently? Oh, he is falling. Yes. And the chain appears. OK, good. All right. So that's how it works, right? The favor goes, and then block one, two, three, four. But you may ask, so where are the forks? What happens to proof of work? Guess what? There are no forks. And there are no proof of work in algorithm, right? So the chain is clean chain from beginning to end. All right. So how about the Byzantine agreement? Well, let me tell you what it is, for those of you who don't know. It's an old protocol, very robust. Uh, in the 80s, uh, Peace, Shostak, and Lamport, and essentially is a way to communicate with one another such that if the majority of us are honest, two guarantees occur, agreement and consistency. Agreement means, OK, there may be bad guys or, and good guys. You can see and guess who is good and who is bad in this picture. 
But the point is that everybody starts with a value in their head, right? But no matter what values the honest guys start, at the end, they agree on the same value. That's property one. And property two means, by the way, if they start with the same value, then they will agree on that value, not just a common value, that value exactly. Both properties are important, right? You want to satisfy them too. Why? Because if it's the only constraint is that we agree on the same thing, in time zero, we can just say one, two, three, let's agree on zero. So what? If we started with the same value, which was not zero, we should agree on that. So both properties are important. By the way, you can see that this is somehow somewhat related with blocks, right? Because in blocks, we want to agree on what the next block is, right? It essentially is an agreement problem. And all this elongated the longest chain is a way to dilute agreement on the block. So Byzantine agreement does this you know, in a very clean, strong way. But what are the challenges? You know, for those also who know Byzantine agreement, the traditional um, uh, protocols are very slow. And they only apply when the number of players is fixed in advance and known. And uh, on the internet, that is not true at all. So there are some challenges, but that is the idea that algorithm wants to use. So the main idea is um, message passing Byzantine agreement. And the main assumption is that the majority of the money in the system is in honest hands. And now let's start to talk about the main technical advantages. The first advantage is computation is trivial. What do you expect to do? To solve some crypto puzzles? No, this takes a long, long time. Here, all you have to do is to add the count, compare two integers, sign a message, verify a digital signature. Nothing to write home about, right? Computation is trivial. The other property is that uh, Algorand is truly decentralized. I shall explain a little bit more as we go. There is a single class of users, not users and miners. Only us, OK? One class together in the same boat. No exogenous anybody. Finally, finality of payments. Why finality of payments? Because in Algorand, there are no forks. I should qualify that. Forks are highly improbable. What does it mean, highly improbable? The probability that a fork arises is 10 to the minus 18. That's a number that I made up, OK? Let me tell you how I choose this number. So get rid of the minus. 10 to the power 18 happens to be the number of seconds from the Big Bang till now. So in other words, another way to say it, if we product, produce a block a second, which is a pretty good clip, we have to wait for the age of the universe to see a fork. You know, that, this I'm willing to, to, to bet on that. The other one is uh, scalability. In Algorand, essentially, we produce a block. We generate a new block as fast as we can propagate it in the network. And better than that, somehow, you cannot get in a, if you want to distribute the system. And the other one is security against a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad, OK? So however, fear not. We are here to defend you against the bad guy. Well, let me tell you why is this monster so monstrous. Because it can immediately corrupt any player he wants, but no more than, say, a third of the internet. That's OK, so it seems to me. It can totally control and perfectly coordinate whoever he corrupts. It can attack the protocol. But never mind attacking the protocol. It can actually simultaneously attack the protocol and the very network on which the protocol runs. And do we need to be so adversarial? And the answer is yes. Because even though right now we, have, we see some big valuations out there right, for blockchains, you know, the true valuation is much higher. It's in the trillions. But the moment in which the trillions of dollars are looking on this chain, this chain is going to be attacked, OK? If you don't think it's going to be attacked by very determined adversary, not the gentlemen, uh, gentlemen who just do selfish mining, you know, really scary individual who attack the network, the protocol, and anything else. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the architecture of Algorand. As you can see, as uh, many pieces, I'm not going to discuss these pieces. I'm going to just give you the highest level structure. 
And the other level structure is very simple. Here there are the billions of users that the blockchain can support, okay? Because this is scales, Algorand scales. And uh, as you can see, there are bad guys galore because there are, unfortunately, bad guys uh, among us. However, as the picture shows, among these billions of people, the majority is honest. Good. Algorand works in two magic phases where the magic is replaced by mathematics. Magic phase one. One user is randomly select among all of them, and by magic, his or her public key becomes common knowledge to the entire network. Okay, what does the selected user do? He concocts a new block, right? Produces a, a new block, looks at all the valid transactions not yet in the blockchain, aggregates them in a block, and, and propagates the block. End of magic phase one. Magic phase two. A thousand people, again by magic, are randomly selected among the network, and that is form a small and, 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 and random committee where public keys are by magic known immediately by everybody. And what do they do? They actually agree on the block proposed by the first person. And why do we need to do that? Because remember, some of us are dishonest. And assume 10% are dishonest, it's a very high percentage, but let's assume. You know, one in 10 of the time, the person selected to propose a block may be malicious. And if it is malicious, what can he do? He can tell you a block, a different block to you, a different block to her. So the fact that you receive a block from the person that you know has been uh, selected to propose a block uh, tells you nothing, because you don't know if everybody else sees the same block that you do. But when you have actually a committee who somehow agrees on the block, things are totally different. Because if 10% of the people are dishonest and you gather a, a random 1,000 one people committee, the probability that the majority is dishonest is infinitely small. So that's the difference. So if you see a block, you have not been selected to propose a block, OK? You have not been selected in the 1,000 people committee to approve this block. That's OK, too. But if you see that one block has 750, say, of the digital signatures of this 1,000 people committee, then what do you know? That is the right next block. Everybody's seeing that, right? That's, uh, that's the idea, OK? So two magic faces. Phase one, somebody uh, is magically selected and proposes a block. Phase two, a thousand of us are randomly selected by magic, and they approve a block. OK, let's do now. That's very clear, OK? However, there ought to be a lot of questions, right? And uh, we are going to try to answer at least the three questions, which are, in my experience, are the ones which will pop up a little bit uh, more than others. And uh, we are going to take some rabbits out of the hat at this point. We are going to do something not quite orthodox here. Why? Because if you keep on doing things the same way, we ended up in Bitcoin or uh, version one or two or three or thing. We had to do something bizarre. OK. The first question that I get m most of the time is, who selects the committee? Mind you, it's very hard to agree on anything. In particular, to agree, a billion people to agree on a thousand people committee is going to take a lot of talking, right? Talk, 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 talk. N we'll never agree on anything. And the answer is a little bit counterintuitive. The committee selects itself. Each member of the committee selects him or herself. If you think about it, it's a G. That is a terrible idea, right? I, in fact, maybe it's the worst idea that one can have. Because if I'm a bad guy, I select myself in this committee and the next and the one after, right? Because I want to be in charge of approving any block I want, right? Well, not so fast. Because to be selected, you must win an individual lottery that you run in the privacy of your own computer. The lottery takes is cryptographically fair. You cannot tilt the odds of winning your own lottery not even if you're a nation state with plenty of um, multiple super duper uh, uh, thousands of supercomputers. You can't do, not do that, all right? And, uh, but if you win this mini lottery only dedicated to you, then you actually have a winning ticket, a proof that you can give others to proving that in fact you are actually a member 
of the committee to approve this block. Okay? So if you run your image, so you heard the block from the, the magically selected person, you see, am I in charge to verify this block, to somehow approve this block? You run your own mini lottery, takes a thousandth of a second to do it. If you have your winning ticket, you propagate to the network your winning ticket and your opinion about the block. And by the way, your probability of winning the lottery is proportional to the total amount of my money you have relative to the total amount of money in the network, in the system, right? That is good to be so true. Otherwise, I can somehow have a sibling attack in which you say, oh, it's not only me, Silvio Micali. I've actually cloned myself. There are 10 million keys that I own, and they all, at least one of them, should be selected. Not really, right? Because the algorithm ensures that if you have a million algos in one public key, or if you have a million keys with one algo each, your probability of being selected in the committee is absolutely the same. All right. OK, at least this committee can be generated instantaneously. And now, OK, what do they do in a way to run Byzantine agreement? But didn't you say they are very slow with Byzantine agreement? Well, not the one we are running. Why? Because it's new and super fast. Define new, well, new is, means whatever it always meant is new. But super fast means that in the number of steps is really um, very few. And what you do in a step, you send a single message. And it's also very, very, very short. So that is really very fast uh, agreement. Now, a more sophisticated question is that to say, gee, why is this secure, OK? This is secure because if I'm an adversary, what I want to do, I would like to corrupt the FASM people committee who are, going to gen who are in charge of approving the block, right? So you guys are these billion users. I'm the bad guy, the adversary. I might be binocular and try to guess who of you is going to belong to this committee. Unfortunately, I don't know because you run your own individual lottery. But once you speak and give your winning ticket and your opinion about the block, I now know who you are, and I can corrupt you right away. But guess what? At that point, corrupting you is useless to me. Because whatever you had to say, you have already said it, right? which is your winning ticket. You are allowed to speak. Your opinion counts for this block. And your opinion about the block are virally propagated throughout the network. And I cannot put back in the bottle these, these two messages, no more than the US government can put back in the, in the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. However, even in such a fast up Byzantine agreement, you have to talk at least a few times. You talk, you respond, somebody talks, right? F say four times, four, one, two, three, four. So perhaps the adversary cannot corrupt you at the first message you send because he doesn't know whom to corrupt. And once you see, it's too late. But he can corrupt you for the second message, in time for the second message, or the third, right? And uh, but again, no, why? Because committee selection is so fast that we are going to select a com different committee for each step of the protocol. Say, gee, that's however it looks a little bit puzzling, right? OK, a committee member speaks once and provides his winning proof and his step X message. But that is nonsense, because assume that we have a simple four-step Byzantine agreement. First step, you guys give away the winning ticket and your opinion about the block. The bad guy, the adversary comes, kills all of you. Your message survives, because you cannot stop that. It's virally propagated. And now a different bunch of people come in for the second step, unrelated to you. And how does this intelligent conversation continue between you and somebody else later, which has nothing to do with you, and somebody else later has nothing to do with you, right? It seems a little bit you know, implausible. Well, it turns out is actually it is plausible. It makes actually sense. Because the Byzantine agreement of Algorand not only is super fast, but actually satisfies another property, a brand new property, which is called the player replaceability, which means that the protocol is executed correctly, even though different people are in charge of running the few different steps of the protocol. And uh, let me actually explain how this happens. 
uh, the best way is uh, a video. A picture is worth a thousand words, and videos is worth a thousand pictures. I'm not good at videos, but I try to animate this as much as I can. OK. So there is one, so here is we are, right? So we, we are these players over there, right? And um, the enemy is over there, and uh, has been uh, put up a very good fight. Our flag is in tatters, but it still proudly flies. And now what are we are going to do? We are going to do one final charge, drive our colors across the field, and clear the field from the enemy. The enemy is very heavily entrenched, so we are going to suffer lots of casualties in between. But yet, our flag will be carried anyway. Ready? Protocol. Charge. Different players all the time, right? Different players. We won. OK. All right. So remember, that's what happens in the, the good old battle, or let's say the bad old battles of old, right, in which you know, whoever carried the flag dies, but doesn't matter. Do you care who exactly substitutes in carrying the flag? We don't care. The important thing is the mission is accomplished at the end. And so these are different committee members for each step. And they, uh, they work. So here are the committee members. What is the relationship between each, each other? None. They are different players. And they're actually different numbers, because a, a lottery de 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 determines who wins and who loses. And so this number can fluctuate. And they have no shared variable. They don't even know nothing. I don't, uh, so, but they have a shared environment, which allows them to act as one, as a single committee. And by the way, this means truly to be a distributor protocol. But in each step, and it doesn't matter who is corrupted or not, the protocol continues with different players all the time. If you do that, you are truly distributed. You are not hostage of anybody, no small group of people. By the way, I don't want to confuse this with other related technologies, such as delegated proof of stake. Because delegated proof of stake, what does it mean? That we put in charge, to avoid proof of work, 20 people for an entire month to decide what the next block is. So, ah, don't worry, next month, different 20 people. I, I tell you the truth, to me, that looks uh, concentrated from the get-go. There's nothing distributed about it, right? And 20 people can actually be taken out by an adversary by a simple denial of service attack. Is it possible to mount a denial of service attack against 20 people? Yes. The end. Well, bonded proof of stake says, oh, we are not a delegated. No, 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 delegated, bad. We are bonded. What does it mean? You put some money in the middle of the table where you, where you cannot touch it. You step aside, and 20 people, 200 people, 2,000 people are willing. Whoever is willing can put money in the middle of the table, and they contribute to produce the block. The people put the money in the table proportionally influence, their influence is proportional to the amount of money that they put at stake. Does this work? Well, let me ask you another question. What fraction of your disposable income can you afford to put in the middle of a table where you cannot touch it, is not invested, not in stock, not in board, hostage? The answer is presumably very little. So in a system like this, what we are doing, we are rolling out a red carpet to make it possible for big thieves with deep pockets to put more money than others on the middle of the table in order to control the blockchain. So in other words, these are really hidden forms of centralization. And we have to remember one thing, that a true decentralization is hard, but attainable. As I, but it, it requires some, some extra effort to deal with it. By the way, let me tell you that there are some uh, um, uh, projects like Ouroboros or the Sleepy Consensus that actually I like. They, they are not proof of work. They actually emphasize the proofs. They are very um, uh, um, uh, sound uh, things. But I still I prefer Algorand, if I may. So in sum, Algorand has no forks, no miners, no proof of work, no weight of confirmation. It's a trivial computation, perfect scalability, transaction finality, and great security. In addition, it has actually some other property. First of all, it's secure against an adversary who can partition the network arbitrarily for an arbitrarily long amount of time. It allows flexible governance without having hard forks. Why? Because I compare 
cryptocurrency to ocean liners on autopilot. Very, very hard, right, to decide the, which coordinates we should navigate before we know where the icebergs are, where uh, obstacles are, where, uh, meteorological condition, right? So to be alive means to change. And we can think very hard how all big should the block be. But if you want to double the size, what do we do? We split the currency. We split the community now. You see, by in Algorand, because you have this magical ability to propose and agree on anything, 99.9% .9 of the time, you agree on the next block. But you can actually also agree on a new rules of a protocol, on a new block size, on a monetary policy, on all kinds of things. You are alive like the community you represent. And then there are also a, diff a, a lot of other things and a, a deep roadmap, which I have not the time to take, tell you. So Algorand, to me, is a kind of, is a, was born to be a unique foundational blockchain developed from first principle and as a deep roadmap of innovation. I'd love to leave you with this picture. This is the Julian Bridge in southern France that actually spanned the Gallon River for over 2,000 years. And by the way, this bridge was never repaired <laughs> for hundreds and hundreds of years. And until 2005, it used to carry trucks and cars. Until somebody had the good idea, maybe we shouldn't, uh, <laughs> only pedestrians are allowed. So that is an example of very basic infrastructure that has allowed the people actually to find each other and cross and find each other across the bridge. I believe that the blockchain, properly constructed, is going to be as useful as any physical infrastructure we have ever built and as beautiful as any physical infrastructure we have ever built. So let's build it properly. Thank you. <laughs>